Uh, kind of sketch out the, um, the outline of my approach to the question of axiology. Generally speaking, axiology is a subdomain of phenomenology that takes for granted the existence of values like truth, goodness, beauty, and justice, which in medieval times were known as the transcendentals. And so there's no attempt to explain, you know, like how we evolved to have these values or what's really going on with values. It's, it's called bracketing, right? You just take, take for granted the phenomenon of value. And then you try to clarify the relationships um, of sort of difference and dependence and connection between different values. In my view, axiology is first philosophy because philosophy inherently involves an evaluation of the world. But to evaluate the world, you need to know what value is or have an account of it. But my conception of the axiological is expanded to include concepts of value from the materialist uh, domain or discourse. In particular, the work of Nietzsche and Marx. Uh, so in essence, both of these thinkers uh, seek to overthrow the traditional idea of value or to critique it. Um, to suggest that it is fake or that it's uh, ideological or um, oppressive in some way. Then Nietzsche proposes a revaluation of all values where he highlights the way that value systems are first of all relative um, and second of all they are works of art in a way, like a strong person gives birth to new values um, in order to satisfy a need of some kind. Um, and then people situate themselves in relation to those values depending on their, their strength, basically. Marx's conception of value uh, has a slightly more world historical quality where he conceives of value in the deepest sense as being exchange value, uh, which because of its abstract quality, like exchange value being uh, the price of something, uh, is a world historical engine for increase of accumulation and productivity and uh, data transmission and that kind of thing. My view here is that generally speaking, it's incoherent to discard the traditional conception of value, but one's sense of what value is should uh, be refined to include these materialist conceptions uh, within it. Um, that it's, it's just as much of an ideological mystification to adopt Nietzsche or Marx's conception of value as it is to adopt like Aquinas's or Plato's conception of value. So in the medieval conception of value, um, which is not taken so seriously in contemporary secular philosophy, but is preserved in 20th century theology. Uh, for example, the work of uh, Balthazar, probably the greatest Catholic theologian of the 20th century, is all structured 
um, according to the uh, these fundamental values, truth, goodness, and beauty. And then there's a fourth that's a bit more nebulous. Usually it's it's considered to be justice, which is a proper balance kind of between truth, goodness, and beauty, or oneness, which is um, the unity of these three. Theologians will unpack what these are uh, with reference to various phenomena that we experience in interpersonal relationships. Um, and I think that's one important point is that there is no value without intersubjectivity. So the first conception would be that truth has something to do with the intellect, beauty has something to do with the imagination, and goodness has something to do with the will. So you kind of imagine these transcendentals as being three dimensions of um, a cosmic mind, uh, which is the Trinity. But you can also conceive of it as dyadic, where there is love, the lover, and the beloved, where somehow love is will, uh, the lover is beauty, and the beloved is truth, because like the beloved is object, the lover is subject, and then love is like an act kind of. Um, and there's sort of a familial version of it, of sort of two parents and a child, you know, I guess father, mother, child. These examples or uh, sort of uh, metaphors or whatever exactly they are, they sound kind of almost too simple or childish, but they're act they're what act what they're what people actually use. Um, you know, and 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 actually, I mean, intersubjectivity and subjectivity are extremely mysterious. So just because it's familiar that we have minds or that we form relationships, uh, the mind and its relationships are probably the most mysterious thing in the world. And there's this idea that in the kind of transcendental field there is a kind of archetype of this that our minds and relationships participate in somehow. So the passage from theology to philosophy here, which is significant since this is the first video in this series that is philosophical rather than theological, involves the question of the unity of the three transcendentals, which are the three persons of the Trinity. So it's a Christian dogma that the three persons of the Trinity um, are truly separate from one another, and yet they're also one substance. And this is a sort of controversial, very important claim. Um, many, uh, you know, heretics were treated, you know, very badly for uh, not not believing it. And the thing is, is that in a philosophical framework, like a Platonic Aristotelian framework, this point is incoherent because, um, you know, a substance intrinsically has to be unique. And the way that this was solved was with the thesis that the Trinity, the nature of the Trinity is a mystery and philosophy is not powerful enough to grasp it. So it, it needs to seem incoherent from, uh, from the philosophical perspective. Like that's, that's what like Aquinas would say. And then in medieval times, ancient times, there would be various 
heresies that would try to make sense of it philosophically, but they would always end up prioritizing one of the three, usually God the Father. Um, that changes with Hegel's philosophy. So according to Hegel, um, first of all, according to Hegel, the whole point of his philosophy is to be able to render in conceptual form for the first time uh, mysteries that until the time of Hegel had to be rendered in symbolic form, in metaphorical or image form. And so for the Trinity, basically, uh, he associates these three terms with the three moments of the dialectic and then proposes that there is a transcendental temporality uh, through which world history unfolds. And world history is God's mind. And at the end of history, the three persons of the Trinity are all one when God is actively thinking uh, thinking the material world and the, the, the distinction between the world and God is gone. Um, but over the course of history, like now, um, uh, the three persons of the Trinity are separate. So the, the twist is they, they really are separate and they really are one and um, it's possible because we're referring to two different eras in transcendental time. And trans transcendental time is a very abstract thing to grasp and I'm not trying to explain it here but anyway that's Hegel's idea and it's it's kind of unclear whether this is a return to uh, heretical Gnosticism uh, or whether it's an actual improvement upon uh, religion. So to turn to materialism, what Marx does is identify the three persons of the Trinity which uh, he he's preserving Hegel's thesis that uh, history is unfolding as sort of the blossoming of God's mind. Um, he identifies them with not some sort of abstract like uh, places in a sentence, like subject, object, verb, or whatever, which is what Hegel does. Um, again, much more simple than you might think, like almost so simple it's like embarrassing to explain for what it is, which is why a lot of people don't understand it. Um, Marx inserts uh, material conditions, specifically industry, science, and culture. So like science is truth, culture is beauty, and industry is will, and they're sort of in this self-amplifying feedback loop where what's underlying their relationship is uh, acceleration. So things are going faster, there's higher and higher connectivity, more and more differentiation of, um, of types of labor, uh, more, more productivity, more efficient productivity, higher population, um, faster data transfer, more data, right? There's just this accumulation. Um, and that is causing history to unfold. So like the world we live in, you know, it's changing so quick because this 
this process is like geometrical and so it's as it multiplies um, it's like Moore's law kind of as it multiplies the numbers go up much faster and so uh, the reason that reality as we know it is being rent apart in such a sort of uh, mind-blowing way right now is because you know each, each year this increases uh, increasing by more so Nietzsche also takes for granted that there's this big world historical accumulation coming up that's catapulting us into a new era that's beyond what our minds can really conceive of. I didn't actually mention that for Marx, but that, that's the idea is that capital, capitalism will eventually fully exhaust itself and then will kind of transform us into beings who are culturally capable of communism and will have um, a material infrastructure that is capable of uh, sustaining a planned economy so that we can spend our time uh, you know, pursuing the development of our talents and learning and creating and growing and sharing with one another. Um, for Nietzsche, this post-human future is, I would say, a little more beyond comprehension, uh, cur current possible comprehension, um, because M Marx takes for granted, well, Marx is not the most consistent philosopher, but he he believes in justice, right? Like he, he thinks that egalitarianism and uh, just the, the, the goodness of social emancipation will continue to exist on the other side of the wall after we cross the singularity. And Nietzsche takes great pride in suggesting otherwise. Um, in, in his view, even morality, like morality as such, not, not just certain, not just the morality of any one regime that might actually be fake and surreptitious and uh, exploitative, but um, our, our, our entire moral matrix um, will, will be overcome and replaced by a mode of valuing and evaluation that that we just we're too limited by our conception of morality to imagine what it would be like you know but it would be like something even more transcendental above uh, the transcendental values that the transcendental values are transcendental over of like um, you know, means type of values like oh that, that it's good to it's good to go to the beach or something like that. So my my basic view is that these two sort of opposed views in uh, basically that Nietzsche and Marx um their entire endeavors are two out of three uh, meta-transcendental approaches to philosophy where basically Marx uh, you know, Marx is concerned with the good and Nietzsche is concerned with the beautiful and the true um, is being approached through I mean, I, I suppose a good candidate is like the Pittsburgh school of like sellers and like the contemporary version of it is Brandom, where uh, the, the idea of truth is sort of something that is preserved, but is sort of radically updated um, in ways that we can't conceive of 
Yes, but that there is this, there is this coherence um, to it that never goes away. Um, and I think a lot of scientific research, especially into, uh, you know, machine learning and computer science and cognitive science is on this side of things. So I suppose that's kind of my thesis for this video is just that in the post Hegelian regime, the, the transcendentals, the true good and the beautiful, um, have sort of just within philosophy, they have become approaches to philosophy that are, um, are typically pursued independently. Philosophers will usually choose one and not take the others seriously. Um, and so in my view, justice would be the correct synthesis of, you know, let's say Nietzsche, Marx, and Brandom. That there would somehow be a way of valuing and making contact with God that, uh, you know, brought these three whole traditions and perspectives into proper harmony. So it may not sound like much, but I think there's actually a pretty unique and penetrating uh, uh, thesis or uh, vision or whatever.